Okay, the data is atomic. The manipulation of that kind of data is actually very, very straightforward when you think about it. If you take a language like SQL, what does SQL do with data? Sorry, I'll take this one. What it does is it subsets the data by column and it subsets it by row. That's fundamentally what it does. And you're thinking, yeah, but I can join lots of tables. True, you can. And when you join lots of tables, you get a big table which you're subsetting by column and by row. So SQL, relational databases, are really, really good at this. And they're very bad at most other things. So how come we've been using relational databases for so long? Interactive. I shouldn't put my hand up because it looks like I want to answer the question. Absolutely. And they are really, really good at, I'll give you a clue, the word ends with actions and begins with trans. Anyone? <laughs> They're really good at transactions. The data is split up. It's normalized. You can change bits. They are fabulously good database engines. So that's the small data. And it's never called small data, which is almost a shame. But that's what I would call tabular data. So then the question is, what's the rest of the stuff? So, oh yeah, one other point I wanted to make is how easy is it to understand relational data? Well, it's taken about 30 years to understand it properly. And if you don't think that's true, you just have to look at the dates. When was the relational model first described? 1970. This gentleman is a professor of botany and he could answer that question. We are sat in a room full of database people and I'm just appalled that you didn't know the answer. <laughs> I've taught them everything I know, yes. and they know nothing. Sorry, which language? Uh, the relational model is simply described in papers, as in human written papers. Ted Codd sat down and said, we need, a relation, we need a database that behaves like this. So that was 1970. First product, 1980. When were transactions finally tied down mathematically? I'll give you a clue, it was 1993. That's 13 years after we started doing transactions in the relational model. And the guy who did it was a guy called Jim Gray, and he got a Turing Award for it. It's non-trivial. What's the Turing Award the computing equivalent of? Nobel Prize. Exactly, he got a Nobel Prize, basically, for doing that. <laughs> it was not, it's not particularly easy to understand properly relational transactions, data, all of that stuff. So I'm making the point that this was not trivial work to do. I'd also like to make the point that work started at IBM, because at the end I want to talk about who's doing the, the real cutting edge stuff. As an academic, I would love to lie to you and tell you it's the academic world. But the original work on relational stuff was done I at IBM. So, that's small data. That's tabular data. Human humongous amounts of data out there is not like that. We're talking about, well, this lot. These are things which you shouldn't tabularize. Now, I say shouldn't because there is a temptation to say you can't put them into a table. And that's stupid because you can tabularize anything. I can take a JPEG, I can turn it into pixels, and put it into a table. Brilliant piece of work, Mark. How many rows have you got, do you think? A fair number. Okay, but you've now got it in a table and you can subset by column and by row. Great, so you can count the number of pink dots. When you store images, what kind of queries might you run against them? Sorry? Who's in it? Anybody care to write the sequel <laughs> that says, is Jane in this photograph? The point is, you can tabularize any data there is some data you simply don't want to. Why? Because you're not going to be doing that kind of stuff. And that kind of stuff is subsetting by column and by row. So, there is a load of data out there which does not sit well in the relational model. And that's the bottom line. And that, all of that data was invented in the year 2010. Discuss. So, does anybody remember seeing a, a picture on a computer before 2010? I think we have, haven't we? So, this data's been around for years. So, one good question is, how come we're not playing with it? 
how come we only started getting interested in 2010? Monetizing. It's difficult. Sorry, was that monetizing? Yeah, it's just such a great word, isn't it? Didn't we do the metadata before? Sorry? Didn't we play with the metadata before? Yeah. I mean, yeah, and the answer is, of course, that we did play with it before. But what happened was it seemed to reach a critical mass in the business world in about 2010. And that's the point I'm making to you. This data didn't suddenly appear in 2010. We didn't <coughs> suddenly start working on it. We've been working on it for years. But it, it came to the, to the consciousness of the, of the data world and, and indeed the real world out there. So, pictures. You could tabularize it, but you don't want to. And again, I want to make a point to you about pictures which are that you can see what you want to see in them. This picture is very dear to my heart. This picture I only require, acquired recently. It's a pen and ink drawing of my house, which was done in the 1930s, which somebody had had in a folder and suddenly discovered and gave to us. We were very grateful. But I tidied it up slightly. And what do you see? Can you all see the horsey? Isn't the horsey pretty? Yeah, n nice horsey. What you see and what I see are totally different because I know the house. I, I can apply context to it. So as soon as I saw this picture, I could see features of the house that we know were there because we can see the bits left over but are gone now. So that porch on the house isn't there anymore, but you can see that it was there once. Um, that's a joint between the house and the barn, and it's gone, but you can see where the... Um, where the beams went into the house. We know, we know it was there. Um, there's an extra, extra door on that Wayne house where they used to keep the hay wains. But also, there's a load of other features we had no idea. There is no wreckage left over from. So, and that's, there's an entire gable on the house we knew nothing about. There's the horse. Uh, there is no evidence of that horse being there. We've looked, we've had a look, there's no hoof prints, it's gone. There's a wall that's missing. There's an extension to the barn there. And what I'm getting at here is that it's almost impossible to say what you're going to use a picture for. If you store a picture, you could write a query which said, is this a picture of a sunset? And you could run that. But you might tomorrow want to say, is this a picture of an elephant? You're not going to write it in SQL. You're going to write it in something else. But we tend not to apply schemas to this kind of data. So we don't smash it up into atomic bits, we don't put it into a table, we tend to store it as a picture file. And that is one of the characteristics of big data. And we've only got minutes to talk about it. And there's a vast range of different types of big data. But I'm just making the point that these are fundamentally different types of data and we tend to handle them very fundamentally differently. Relational data, you atomize it, you apply a schema. Big data, in the main, you don't apply the schema, you store it, and you essentially formulate the question when you run the question. And people will talk, you may have heard this term, late binding schema. Well, you're applying the schema when you ask the question. It's all gone black. No, that's all right. So, and I've just said this here, we tend to store the Big data is schemaless or apply a late binding schema. Now, there is a wonderful paradox, incidentally, which I don't have time to go on to, but we can talk about if we've got question time, if we want to, which is that if you find supporters of the relational model, they say, you build a schema and you can ask any question of the data. That's why you put the schema on it. The supporters of NoSQL stuff say you don't apply the schema so that you can ask any question of the data. Have you noticed a minor paradox in there? And that is a fascinating discussion point as to how that works and how you, how you resolve that paradox. But we'll leave it for the minute because there's lots of other stuff we want to talk about. So big data is usually non-tabular. It usually comes in very large quantities, hence the term big. It's Tabular data, I think, also counts as big data if there's a lot of it and if you're going to do things that are not subsetting by row and by column. One of the other central tenets of the relational model is that the, the data is inherently unordered. Have you all heard this banded around, that data, sets of data are not ordered? 
okay, if that doesn't has a, have a resonance with you, think about this. If I give you a table and I say there's one person in there called John Smith, can you find the row for John Smith with SQL? I would hope the answer is yes. Can you now return the row for John Smith and the row above it using standard SQL? What's the construct in SQL for the row above? No, that there is no construct, not in standard SQL. Well, if you order it, but it's inherently unordered. And you can find the primary key value above the one you're looking at. And we all have manipulated data in various ways to do this. The point is that standard SQL doesn't let you do that. And my point is that en SQL engines are not particularly good at doing that because they're not designed to do it. So if you take a good example of data that I would consider big data, even though it's tabular, even though it's tabular, and stick your left arm up, yeah. <laughs> even though it's tabular, is log file data. Now, I think it's tabular for several reasons. One is it comes at you very fast. If you're eBay, those files come at you pretty quickly. It's also um, really common to look for order in a, web in a web log file. Have, you, have any of you seen this kind of diagram before now? This is looking at how people go into and use a website. They come in, or quite a lot of them come in on this page, move to this page, move to this page, and, and, and close their accounts. You're looking at a row, and then you're saying, find the next row for that customer. Whoa. You don't want to do that in SQL. Can you do it? I'm sure lots of people in this room could do it. Is it an engine optimized for doing that? No. There are other engines that are much better optimized. So again, we're extending our definition of big data to say, and I would say the best definition I can give you of big data is, if you have some data and you can handle it well in a relational engine and it fits nicely into tabular data, do that and I would not call that big data. If you get to the stage where you need to do slightly bendy, tweaky stuff with it in a SQL en in a relational engine to get it to do what you want, but it's working fine, stick with the program. Don't change it. Don't go and buy a big data engine. But when the pain of doing those manipulations gets so great that you are banging your head against a brick wall, then it's big data. This is the Whitehorn brick wall head hurting data definition. But I think it works reasonably well. So, who did this work? Well, the clue's up there. A lot of this work was done by companies like Google and Yahoo and eBay. They started developing the engines and the data descriptions to do this. Note it wasn't the academic world, but also note the difference. Who was doing it the last time? Who did the relational stuff? IBM. IBM. And IBM is a data manipulation company. That's their job. <coughs> this time around, it's the customers. Isn't that interesting? I think it is, anyway. The driver for this is coming from the commercial world. And I think the academic world is doing a fabulously good job of picking it up. And the academic world will spend five years dotting an I. I think you'll find that dot needs to go there. But they tie it down, and they get the Nobel Prize for doing it. And they should do. But it's the... It, the driver is coming from the companies who have to handle all of this data. So, having said all of that, I did say we'd talk about the application of commercial techniques to the scientific world, because it's interesting. So that's what we're going to be talking about for pretty much the rest of this talk. Anybody recognize this guy? Can you hold oh it? Yeah, Sorry, sure. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought there was a bit of Yeah, there's a clue on the T-shirt, just in case. Thank you. That is Charles Darwin. Note that Charles Darwin was born with a beard. Ev virtually every image you will ever see of him has a beard. Are you all aware that he invented evolution? Befo before him, it didn't exist, and then suddenly it was... No, no, he discovered evolution. Very, very quick potted history of evolution. In order to understand and believe in evolution, you have to believe that 
Um, organisms inherit characteristics from their parents. There is variation within species, because if all of you were identical, the next generation would all be identical. And the unfit die before breeding. And you put those three together and you have evolution. So, potted history of Darwin. Darwin leapt aboard a ship called the Beagle. He went round the world, got to the Galapagos Islands, got off. Hmm, interesting set of islands you have here. Um, oh, on this island there are finches. That's interesting, they're finches, but they've got bigger beaks than normal. How interesting. They eat seeds. Oh, over on this island, exactly the same species of finch, but the beak is smaller and it has different food. There is variation within a species. I must think about this. 30 years later, out pops a book that changes the world. That is a potted history of Darwin's discovery of evolution. Um, you find it all over the place. I mean, everybody is happy to say that. This evening, I googled um, Galapagos and Epiphany. And what does it come up with? Darwin's epiphany occurred on the Galapagos Islands where he discovered blah, blah, blah. It's great. It's just not true. It's fascinating, but wrong. And the proof of it is in this paper in 2005, which appeared in Nature. And this guy, um, John Parker, is this guy. We happen to have, in this room, two professors together who have known each other for a very long time. Um, and we produced this paper, which basically rewrites that entire story. Did um, Darwin discover evolution? Absolutely yes, no question. Did he have a, an epiphany on the Galapagos? Nonsense. Now, a very interesting question is, <clears throat> how do you prove that? How can you prove what somebody was thinking all those years ago? <laughs> yeah, you just have to ask Darwin. Oh, no, that's not. Read his diaries. So, this is the story of that journey. Let me take you back in time. Well, this is the guy. John was my PhD supervisor a long time ago. Um, actually, it's more... Yeah, he was, he was younger in those days. But no, no, no better looking than now. One thing you have to understand about being a PhD student, you are forever in the, your PhD supervisor's debt. I have to buy him beer, I have to be nice to him. It, it never stops. It just goes on and on and on. And so, long man remains. <laughs> yeah. Do you want another pint, John? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. So, so, John, amongst his other many achievements, <coughs> I, I wouldn't like to embarrass you by telling you that he's a world-class geneticist, which is how I met him. I wouldn't like to tell you he's a world-class botanist. I wouldn't like to tell you he was the director of the Botanic Gardens at Cambridge. But you can imagine he's all right at a few odd bits and pieces. Anybody been to the Botanic Gardens at Cambridge? Yeah, you've got to go. They are beautiful. They are superb. These are just eye candy to show you how beautiful they are. You want to see more eye candy? Oh, isn't that beautiful? So John was the director, and John rang me up one day um, and said, oh, you've got to come over for the weekend. There's something in the garden I've got to show you. So he'd been in the Botanic Garden for how long at this point? About eight years. About eight years. So I went over. And one thing you have to understand is that John taught me botany and genetics. And I became an average gene geneticist. I was always an appallingly bad botanist. It became a standing joke. I can, yeah, I, and he's not wrong. I'm terrible at identifying plants. My wife is fabulously better than I am at identifying plants. So John came over, and the garden closed, and we went for a walk in the garden. And John took me around the garden and started asking me questions. And he said, have a look at these trees, he said. What species are they? It didn't have the big sign at the top, okay? It was just, they were just trees. And I, I knew he was winding me up. And I said, I don't know, John. I can't do, you know I can't do trees. What do you think they are? Oh, they're a pinus of, they're, they're some kind of fir tree, John. And he said, well, they're actually pinus nigra. And he said, you'll notice this subspecies, these are two different species. This one has its arms that go up to meet the sun because it grows in a Mediterranean climate. This one has its droopy arms going down because when the snows fall on it, when it grows in the cold climates, 
The snow doesn't break, break the branch, branches. Same species, different variety. Fine, okay, good. Took me on the front fan. What are those two trees? Oh, God. They're, they're a quercus of some kind. It's an oak of some description. So John told me about that one. And what he showed me that evening was the entire garden was laid out to demonstrate variation. And I realized very early on, it's a fabulous teaching tool. You know, I don't teach biology. I started life as a, as a biologist and a geneticist, but I don't teach it anymore. But it's a fabulous place to teach it. And so we wandered around, and John was waiting for the penny to drop, and nothing dropped. And he said to me, do you know when the garden was laid out? No, no idea. It was 1825, wasn't it? 18? About 1830, by the time. So before Exactly. The penny finally dropped. It was before Darwin had his epiphany. Well, that can't be, because Darwin is the guy who's credited with studying variation. I'm not saying people didn't observe variation before, but there's a difference between observing it and studying it. So this was a major problem. And what John had also discovered by that time is a bit about Darwin's history. Darwin studied at Cambridge, and Darwin went to Cambridge, and in his first year, he went to the lectures of a guy called John Stevens Henslow. In his second year, he went to the lectures given by a guy called John Stevens Henslow. And in his third year, he went to the lectures of John Stevens Henslow. And it would be fair to say that John Stevens Henslow was his mentor. And you will be delighted to know, not only do I have a picture of John Stevens Henslow, I have a picture of him with Darwin, and Darwin does not have a beard. <laughs> I think this talk was worth it for that alone. So, Henslow, it turns out, was a fascinating guy himself. He was professor of mineralogy at Cambridge by the age of 26. He took holy orders in by when he was 28, and he was professor of botany at Cambridge by 29. He was A, very well connected, B, he bribed a lot of people, or C, he was very bright. Any takers? Bright. I think bright. I, I think we could rush to that. I know, yeah, just, just accidentally. You have to. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to, aren't you, anyway? So. so, he's an unbelievably bright guy and quite clearly a polymath. And the nice thing about it is when you read about him, everybody loved him. He was not a pain in the neck. This is not true of all the professors I've ever met. So, we suspected that Henslow was studying variation. Actually, I, do you notice the way I grandly slipped in? We suspected it, yeah. Okay, John had thought of the idea first, okay. But we thought, well, how do you prove it? Because going to the scientific community and saying we wish to overturn a, a fondly held belief of a long period because we think the guy was studying variation is going to lose you your career, basically. So you have to have proof. So, Henslow built a herbarium. And a herbarium, I like to think of as dead plants stuck to bits of paper. Because that's what it is. Why was he sticking dead plants to bits of paper? Because they were studying life. They were studying how life was organized. Hugely important thing to do. They were going out, not just Henslow, but other people were building up these herbaria, which are collections of plants so they could compare them. And they were working out how all life is organized. Now, bear in mind, they weren't looking at this from an evolutionary perspective. They were looking at it as how is life organized. So they were just looking at the handiwork of God, because God had made everything. But one thing that John noticed early on, and Gina, I think, as well, had noticed, yeah, was that most people... Sorry? Me, really. Oh, John, really, no, yes, I yes. I don't want to give anybody else a No, 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 no. <laughs> Good Lord. We're professors. We don't yeah. do that. So almost all the, the other herbaria in the world, you get one sheet of paper, you get one plant on it, and it says, this is Crepus capillaris. What Henslow was doing was putting multiple plants on a sheet, as you can see here. And he had people going out all over the place collecting. And if you notice, this says Charles Darwin. Well, OK, I'll magnify it a bit so you can see it. He had Charles Darwin collecting. Why? Because Darwin was his pupil. Now, this sheet has eight plants on it. They are all mature. This is a, a, a grass. It's a phleum. This grass is fully mature. That's the seed head. None of these plants are going to get any bigger. It's not that they went out and nicked little, little ones that were growing. They're all mature. Would you say that there is variation in the size of that? 
Anyone? Anyone? Would you also say, and this is a judgment call, would you say they'd been laid out at random or to show the variation? I mean, I'm convinced already, but we, th we thought so. So, okay, we're beginning to see signs that he was doing this. And can you see a pattern there? I can. Notice that he was a database freak. He classified everything. Where, whoops, sorry. Where the plants were collected, Mildon Hall in Suffolk, who collected them, the date they were collected, and the numbers. He provided huge amounts of information. Why? Because he was a good scientist. But that meant that we could take these herbarium sheets and we took a sample of them. There are 1.1 million sheets in that collection. This guy was a little obsessive. I mean, this is a super sock collection that he's built up. You know. And what we did was we built a database. Have you all heard of databases? This is a nice normalized database. Front-end access, back-end SQL server. We collected the data. We stripped an obsessive amount of data off each sheet. I say we, grandly. Who did most of the work, John? Um, <coughs> yes. I've never been the same man since. <laughs> so John did most of the hard work. And we were able to do the usual kind of tabular analysis. You know, this is tabular data. You can do the tabular analysis. And one of the things we did which was almost unheard of in those days in the scientific world, is we used an OLAP cube. I'll spell it for you later. O uh, we used normal kind of, what we would consider in the business world, perfectly normal analytical techniques. But to the scientific community of that era, of this type of work, it was a revelation that you could do that. And it's a really good example of this stuff moving back that way. Some of the development work of multidimensional databases was done by the academic world, but it didn't come back for a long time. So people were doing this kind of stuff in Excel. So we used what we would consider very mundane technologies to analyze this. But we also, and bear in mind this is about 2005, 6, 7. The paper was 2005, we went on working. We also decided to cross-analyze the tabular data with big data. Good example of big data, the world. The world is a set of big data. And we're talking about mapping here. So one of the questions we had to test our hypothesis, our hypothesis is Henslow is collecting for variation. Now you can build up hypotheses. You can say he's based in Cambridge. If he's not collecting for variation, he will just pot around Cambridge and get all the plants he can. And when he's hoovered up all the ones around Cambridge, only then will he start traveling outwards. If, on the other hand, he's interested in variation, he will want plants from the same species from as many different places as possible, which means that he will start collecting all over the country as soon as he starts building the collection. So there are two possibilities here. One is whoosh. And if the collection starts in the middle of Cambridge and goes outwards over time, goes outwards over time, he's not interested in variation. If it's splat, he's collecting all over the country at the same time, right from the word go, he's after variation. It's a hypothesis. In science, you put up a hypothesis and you test it. How do you do that? We started mapping the data. This is commonplace now. At the time we did it, as far as we know, we were amongst the first people to do this. We were using the spatial data types in SQL Server. We did this with the beta of SQL Server. And we pre actually presented this at the launch of SQL Server 2008. Because um, it was the first use of spatial data. So there is the interface we built. 19, uh, 1820, uh, first two plants Henslow collected near his parents' house. He then is going to start work at Cambridge. And what I'm going to do is run through 10 years for you. And you're going to see 10 years' worth of data. And you're going to see either it starts and spreads, or it's all over the place. And before we ran this software, we asked Junior Morell, who's another author on the paper, who'd looked after that collection for 25, 25 years. Mm. We said to her, are the early ones around Cambridge and the later ones elsewhere? And she said, there are 1.1 million of them. Do you really expect me to be able to answer that? Which was a fair comment. 
But I'm making the point that you can't do this just by looking at it. Okay, are you all ready? We're going to go through them in about five, six seconds. Three, two, one. He's all over the place. He started collecting and he's collecting everywhere. He's actively looking for variation. That's it. But that is an amalgamation of tabula and big data. And that's where the enormous power of this starts to happen. Is not when you're advertising just the big data or just the tabular data, it's when you put the two together. And we're going to talk about, I've got to talk fairly quickly here, what is data science? Data science is using data intelligently. There you are, I've summed it up for you. But I'll show you a good example of that. We came up with this question, ignoring time, so ignore when they were collected, are most of the plants around Cambridge or not? Now basically we knew the answer to this because you can see that a lot of them are Cambridge. But if you're a good scientist, you check stuff. And sometimes when you check stuff, you uncover stuff you didn't even think you'd see. So. I took, or we took all the plants in uh, an 80 kilometer, 50 mile radius around Cambridge. All of them collected over the entire span of this herbarium. And we simply plotted the number against distance. And what you get is that. So as you move away, the cumulative total goes up. That's fair enough. But when you look at that, there's something odd about it. Because it's quite clearly two straight lines. It, that is not a good fit to a curve, it's a good fit to two straight lines. And there is something weird happening at 23 kilometers around from, away from Cambridge. And we looked in vain for a mountain range that surrounded Cambridge at 23 kilometers because we thought, well, it's got to be there, but it wasn't. But okay, why is there a step change at around 23 kilometers? Did he change his mind? No, well, not that we know of. It's as far as horses can go in a day. What you're looking at is the kind of wreckage of the transport system and what effect that had on the collection of, this, of these plants. And we just didn't expect to see that. But unless you plot the data and unless you play around with the data, you're never going to see this stuff. Nobody asked that question, but we uncovered it. The other one we are both, I think, enormously fond of was the fact that we discovered a group of data, a set of data, which was all collected by one guy with the glorious name of the Reverend Tupany, and all in Scotland. And so we became interested in this. Now bear in mind, we have all the data. We know the dates, we know the location. So it meant that we could look at the data collected in Scotland on that date, and we could trace this guy's journey through Scotland. And we could watch him going through Scotland. And he goes up, and then he goes up the Great Glen. We can tell it took 10 days to go up the Great Glen. This guy is, didn't leave a diary that we've ever known or ever found about. But we can track his history. And then we can see him coming back. And once we knew he was on there, we started keeping an eye out for him. Now, you think speed cameras are bad. He was going down the Great North Road, he can't resist it, he picks up a plant, bang, we've got him on the 13th of September at a roadhouse. That's it, he picked up the plant, he made a fatal mistake, we've got him. This, in essence, I'm going to end up saying, is what I think data science is about. Data science is about doing intelligent stuff with data. That's what makes it different from the job of being a DBA. And I'm not saying DBAs don't do intelligent stuff with data, they clearly do because John will kill me if I don't say that. I thought I'd better add that bit in. But it's the playing with data, it's the experimentation, it's the what happens if we plot this against maps. The other thing you can do is you can take any one of those points and you've married the, the tabular data to the um, map data, the big data. So we can start zooming in on that. Now I don't know if you noticed that's um, collected by Richard Tupany at Fort George. Okay, well, let's zoom in. Let's zoom in further. There's Fort George. The wreckage of it is still there. Okay, that's just fun. But let me put it to you this way. Suppose we take all of the plants, and we know all the species, that grow on marshy ground. We have a look at all those sites and see many, how many of them have housing estates on them. 
because the botany from that period will tell you what the ground was like. Did we think of that when we did it? No. That's data science. So, I think the truth about all of this, and I hate to admit it as an academic, is the commercial world leads and the academic follows and makes it rigorous. And this is not to say there aren't fabulously good academics doing really good work. There are people like Mike Stonebreaker doing groundbreaking work at MIT. And I'm not saying that the academic world is not doing imaginative stuff. It's doing fabulous work. Why would I run down the career that I've spent my life in? Because I love it so much. But I just noticed that if you look at the changes in the significant changes over the last four or five years about how we're thinking about data, a lot of that originated in commercial companies. Well, that's fine then, because the academic world, we will spend our time improving that, coming up with variations on it. But I, I just think it's an observation. I'd love to be able to tell you all of this started in computer science labs. It started in the computer science labs when we trained the people who went to those companies. That's true. But a lot of this innovation is coming from the commercial world. So how do the big retailers, this was something else that was actually on the title, so you'll be pleased to know we're heading towards the end. And the answer is they're doing data science. And data science, I think, is absolutely an amalgam of these two worlds. It's taking the scientific rigor and the scientific hypothesis testing and applying that to commercial work. And that is where we are making huge difference in commercial companies. And just a plug for the register is that our highly intelligent editors have commissioned me to write about these kind of areas. And these are areas that I found unbelievably useful in doing this kind of work. And I think, I mean, I just think they're fascinating. I really do. Um, but we're going to be writing some more about these. But some of these are, I, I think, fascinating. So I kind of leave you with this thought. Big data, I think, is fundamentally different. The kind of stuff we're doing with it, we can do with it, is mind-boggling. It is not the same as tabular data. It is different. The danger for me is that the people who are driving this are the commercial world. I thought you gave them credit for inventing it. I do. But what I'm saying is that I think society ought to be deciding what we're going to do with big data and what's right and what's wrong and what is an invasion of privacy and what isn't. And I hate to say it, but if you expect the politicians to be up to speed on this, well, none of you do, do you? And that, I think, is a real problem because what's happening at the minute is the commercial companies are de deciding what is right and what is wrong. And if you don't believe that, think about Google. Think about Google taking Street View. Did they ask permission to do that? No, they did it to see if they were going to get sued or not. Did they accidentally, and by mistake, I hasten to add, they by mistake nicked a lot of IP addresses and passwords. And I fully accept, because I'm on tape and being filmed, that that was a mistake and Google did not do that on purpose. And I don't think anybody in this room would disagree. That's good. Am I talking about war driving? Um, Mark doesn't know what you mean, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm talking about, indeed. I've led a very sheltered life. Um, yeah, I'm talking about the fact that they accidentally wrote the software and included it and stored terabytes of data by mistake. And then they said, oh, sorry, we didn't mean to do that. I think there is a fundamental problem here. I don't think society understands how important this data is and what it's going to do to society. And I think there ought to be a debate about how we're going to handle this and what is acceptable and what isn't. And that is not happening at the moment. It's happening piecemeal. So I don't have a solution to this. I just thought I'd highlight the problem to you. Beer time. <laughs>